the lush green Northwest United States, a ticking time bomb prepares to unleash its deadly force. By the time you hear it coming, it's going to be too late. And only a few minutes will decide who lives and who dies. Hundreds of thousands of people in these areas that would lose their lives. Entire communities will disappear from the earth. We have to understand that this is kind of a devastation that we haven't seen, and it's, it's unheard of. It sounds like science fiction, but it could happen tomorrow. If an eruption occurs at Mount Rainier in Washington State. Stretching from British Columbia to California, the Cascade Range is renowned for its thousand miles of towering peaks and boarding has front row seats. It's beautiful scenery. It's quiet. Um, we couldn't ask for more. I'm sure everybody else in the world is envious of us people that live in Ordi because it is such a beautiful valley with such a great mountain. But this peaceful hamlet may face a ghastly burial because soaring 14,000 feet over Ording is a terrifying threat. Mount Rainier. If Mount Rainier blows, a 40-foot wall of cement-like mud would descend into the town, destroying every structure and every living creature in its path. So basically, you're looking at a wall of flowing concrete that could start moving 40 to 50 miles an hour. For those who find it hard to believe that something so beautiful could wreak so much devastation, take a look 50 miles to the south at another Cascades volcano, Mount St. Helens. It is here that we can find clues to the disaster that awaits at Rainier. St. Helens perfect conical shape and peaceful wilderness made it a prized possession of the Northwest. It was called the Mount Fujiyama of America. It was so perfect and so beautiful. But deep inside Mount St. Helens is a fiery hell. For thousands of years, molten rock has been forming, then cooling, generating huge bubbles of gas. Enormous pressure has built up, weakening the outer layer of the volcano. And by early 1980, Mount St. Helens was beginning to show signs of unrest. The first hint that Mount St. Helens was waking up back in 1980 uh, were earthquakes that started to occur in March. Soon after the quakes came more signs, small steam and gas explosions at the summit. Saturday, May 17th, 1980. Keith Ronholm, a graduate student in geophysics, heads to Mount St. Helens. I wanted to get close to the mountain to try to see what I, what I could see. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. And I thought, well, if I go down, maybe I'll get a chance to see an eruption, and then I can say I've seen a volcano erupt. At first, Ronholm is disappointed. No steam, uh, no ash, no earthquakes, nothing. But inside the volcano, it's the final countdown to a major blast. For Mount St. Helens, time is up. Sunday, May 18th, 8.32 a.m. There was an earthquake beneath St. Helens. The top of the mountain proceeded to ripple like a wave of jello. And almost immediately, the north side of the volcano began to slide. Keith is immediately transfixed. I looked out to my, my side and I couldn't believe what I saw because the entire north face of the mountain was sliding down. This collapsed into the greatest avalanche in recorded history. So I dove for my camera, jumped out of the back of the pickup, and stood there in my t-shirt and underwear and started to take pictures. Keith feels safe 10 miles from the mountain. But closer to the blast, the scene is apocalyptic. The blast itself, the blast hurricane, picked up these 10 foot wide trees like they were toothpicks and scattered it hundreds and hundreds of acres across the land. Fires blew across the land. 
Meanwhile, Keith Ronholm watches in awe as the volcano unleashes its fury. And it began to curl over the ridge and flow towards me. Within about 30 seconds, Keith realizes he'd better get out while he still can. And at this point, I uh, had to jump into the car, back up, turn around, and start to drive away. And I took one last picture over my shoulder. And uh, I always apologize for being motion blurred, but it was uh, a pretty scary thing to, to be taking a picture over your shoulder as there's this blast cloud coming towards you. Keith has only driven 10 minutes when ash, mud, and hail start raining down from the summit, still about 10 miles away. The uh, cab of the pickup truck began to fill with ash, and I was starting to breathe this stuff in. I started to get this, this panicky kind of thing where I was, I was hyperventilating and I was breathing fast. The ash can be deadly, but even more dangerous is the mud. The superheated ash, rock, and gases have melted the mountain's glacial ice, triggering raging mud flows with the texture of wet concrete. It raced down valleys. It smashed everything in its way. All the trees were taken down. It was massive. It took houses up. These frightening flows are the real enemy. They are known as lahars. A lahar is, it's an Indonesian word for a mud flow. And it's basically a mixture of snow and ice, mud and trees and rocks. Luckily, Keith is not in the path of the lahars. And when the ash finally stops filling the cab of his truck, he safely escapes to the nearest town. But not everyone was so fortunate. When Mount St. Helens erupted, 57 people perished. 200 homes were devastated. And 230 square miles of surrounding countryside were destroyed. It was life-changing um, for me and for all of the people in, in the, the Pacific Northwest. I think it's important for, for everyone to know how powerful nature can be. You go up there today, and you still see what almost looks like desert. And it's taken the land a long time to heal. Today, the Mount St. Helens eruption remains the worst in U.S. history. But it may be the Washington warm-up to a far greater tragedy. You could easily have the same type of eruption on Mount Rainier. If Mount Rainier erupts, it could unfurl devastation even worse than that seen at Mount St. Helens. Because Mount Rainier is more lethal than Mount St. Helens in several terrible ways. When lahars flow down the mountain, they need water, in this case from melted ice, to fuel their raging descent. And that's what makes Mount Rainier the most dangerous volcano in the U.S. Because when it comes to ice, Mount Rainier's craggy peaks take the cake. They have over one cubic mile of it. The amount of snow and ice that is sitting on the summit of Mount Rainier is greater than all of the snow and ice that exists on all of the other Cascade volcanoes put together. Second, the area is far more populated. Hundreds of thousands of people live in the many small cities near the mountain. With Mount Rainier, we have cities very close to the mountain, which puts a lot of people in harm's way. And the mountain is an active volcano. It erupted as recently as the mid-1800s, and lahars have occurred here many times in the past. About 5,600 years ago, we had a lahar that was one of the biggest to have occurred on Mount Rainier. One of the biggest. Ancient sediment deposits show a history of multiple lahars which engulf the region. Everything in Ording is built on a former mud flow. Scientists know that if a lahar flowed today, it would follow the same path because the contours of the valleys are fundamentally the same. Only this time, there are thousands of people in the way. There are probably over 100,000 people living on deposits from old lahars from Mount Rainier. And the ultimate killer blow? This mountain could spring into action even without a full eruption. A lot of people don't realize you, that you don't need an eruption to have a lahar at Mount Rainier. The entire northwestern flank has been weakened over millions of years by a constant barrage of heat and water from inside the volcano. 
this chunk of rock, snow, and ice towers directly above Ording. And geologists now believe it could come smashing down any day. Mount Rainier is capable of a spontaneous flank collapse, which means something could happen without any warning whatsoever. A volatile mountain with a devastating storehouse of mud, which could give way at any second. It's a nightmare waiting to happen. If such an eruption happened on Mount Rainier, we could have a catastrophe that would kill hundreds of thousands of people. Rocks rain down from the sky. Day becomes night as ash fills the atmosphere. It happened in 1980. And out across this barren reminder of Mount St. Helens' destruction lies another deadly threat, Mount Rainier. A full-scale eruption that could impact the whole state and be catastrophic. The Earth's crust is broken up into tectonic plates, and Ording sits near the border of a continental plate. At this border, an oceanic plate dives under the continental plate, dragging sediment and water with it. The act of doing that causes a melting of that material, a remelting of that material in the formation of magma, molten rock. The magma is less dense than the surrounding rock, so it rises toward the surface, cooling and crystallizing along the way. And that magma is what ultimately drives the eruptions we see in the Northwest. As magma crystallizes, it generates gas pockets, which work their way to the top of the magma chamber. The pressure builds until gases and magma must finally find a way out. But unlike Mount St. Helens, the eruption itself at Mount Rainier will probably be small, which means less warning for Ording residents like the Sokolik family. Diamond 10. Okay. So they must be prepared to act quickly. Okay. The lahar was coming. It's um, grabbing my daughter and getting everybody's attention, and let's go. The Sokolik family has planned their evacuation route through the backyard and up the hillside. But Ording residents may only have 40 minutes to evacuate the valley floor before it's engulfed by a river of mud. Everything would be slow and tranquil in Ording. Just business as usual in the shadow of a 14,000 foot active volcano. I sleep well. And I look at that mountain every day and I thank God that I can, I'm within view of it. It's a thing that brings peace of mind because it stands up there so strong. It's beautiful. But nature's beauty can sometimes be only skin deep. In one moment, everything changes. The pressure of the scalding gas and magma from inside the volcano have become too great for the rocky crust to withstand. Searing rocks and ash burst out of the volcano, unseen and unheard by the residents of Ording. Beginning its furious descent of the mountain, the superheated material becomes a pyroclastic flow. That's like an avalanche of hot rock that comes down from the vent, sometimes traveling very, very fast, over 100 miles an hour. Extremely dangerous flows. Anyone on the mountain has little chance of survival. Scorching hot rocks and ash fly through the air, killing on impact. Ice and snow immediately melt, releasing billions of gallons of water down the flanks of the volcano. At first, it follows the paths of natural drainages, like the Puyallup and Carbon Rivers, quickly turning into a rushing mud flow. 20 minutes later, it has become a full-fledged lahar, and it's flowing directly towards the unsuspecting residents below. It's ripping up trees, and if it comes into contact with buildings, it's demolishing the buildings and just carrying all of this debris with it and traveling at speeds of 30 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour, racing down the valley and into the towns. It would just be absolutely terrifying. When you're dealing with ash and, and dirt and rock, trees are going to be pushed down. It's just not going to be a pretty sight. 40 minutes after the eruption, this churning gush of debris comes thundering down into Ording. The Lahar spills into Ording from the southeast, rolling straight through the farms and pastures up along Route 162. Within minutes, it inundates the coffee shops, eateries, and bars along Washington Avenue, Ording's main drag. The vehicles would be probably covered in mud. It would be so high that if they were in the houses, they might be stuck in that house. 12, 18 feet. 
That would be about your, your height that is expected. After pulverizing Ording's business district, the Lahar descends on the Ording Middle School, Ording High, and Ptarmigan Reach Elementary, which all together hold 2,000 students. It courses out the other side of town to the newer housing developments in the north, including Leslie Sokolik's house. Uh, the whole neighborhood, yes. It, would, it's, it could be totally destroyed, um, not just this neighborhood. Like I said, it, down the whole valley. Anyone spared by the drowning mud would have to rush to their roofs, and they see a muddy hell filled with shredded debris around them. So the person's going to be on, on top of their home if it makes it, which is unlikely, but they would look around and see materials flowing, and the roadway's not going to be where it once was, and the rivers are going to be someplace completely different. Finally, after dumping its load of mud and debris, the flow will stop, leaving a barren wasteland where a thriving town once stood. Cars, trees, their neighbors' homes, just about anything. It's very unlikely, at least in the city of Ording, that, that anything would survive. The town will have been wiped off the map and rendered uninhabitable. The town of Ording sits in the path of a killer mud flow. But have the locals taken enough precautions to mitigate this disaster? the people who live in Oregon and throughout the Puyallup Valley, I think they are prepared. The first step is to detect an oncoming lahar. We've installed a series of sensors on the upper Puyallup River Valley. These sensors would detect the ground vibrations generated by a lahar, sending an automated signal to local emergency response centers. Then a citywide system of sirens is activated. But not everyone will hear them, as some residents discovered during a recent false alarm. Yeah, we live in Ording, and we were actually home, and we could not hear the alarms. We did not even know that they went off. If they hear the alarms, residents know they have 40 minutes to evacuate. And the one key to survival sounds simple. Get out of the path of the Lahar and onto higher ground. But the geography around Ording makes this difficult. Ording is unique because it's flanked by two rivers, the Puyallup and the Carbon. It means residents are effectively trapped between the two rivers. The only way out is across two bridges, and these could turn into bottlenecks. There's not going to be time to deal with that, so people will leave their vehicles and start to evacuate on foot, and then you've got complete gridlock. Some fear the congestion will cost lives, and if it happens during a school term, it's the children who are in the most danger. They've got a special problem down there with evacuating the schools because there's no easy way for the kids to get to high ground. Loading almost 2,000 underage evacuees onto buses is a logistical nightmare, and the buses themselves will add to the traffic jams. So residents are taking matters into their own hands. Local activist Chuck Morrison is campaigning to build a footbridge called Bridge for Kids to avoid the chaos of the roads. There is enough volume in the system to service 12,000 people in a 40-minute time frame. The footbridge would be over 20 feet wide and span 260 feet across the Carbon River. So we have accounted for the children, we've accounted for the rest of the population to, to take from time of warning and to move this way and go up that hillside. That's, that's the plan. But what are the chances that this mountain will send deadly lahars into nearby towns? If Mount Rainier erupts, there's no question the stakes are extremely high. Hundreds of thousands of lives in all the surrounding cities. But many have made their peace with a threat looming above them. Every part of the state, country, has issues. Asami, hurricanes, earthquakes. So this is just our issue that we deal with. If we fly a plane and we know how dangerous that is, we drive a car, we know how dangerous that is. But experts believe there is a shocking one in seven chance that area residents will experience a lahar in their lifetimes. A one in seven chance. I mean, if I had a one in seven chance of winning the lottery, I, I'd spend all of my money on lottery tickets. And for a volcano survivor, it's a decision never to be taken lightly.
It's a hazard calculation that each and every person has to make. Mount Rainier will erupt again. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And it could happen tomorrow.